Okay, everybody, we are on question number 20. I'm going to try to get through 20 through 26 a little bit more uh, rapidly. I'll still try to, of course, cover the, the material, but I think that we can move along a little bit uh, faster than we have. Okay, so this says, uh, which of the following themes is most likely to be addressed in the mythology of an ancient culture? Okay, so we want really like the, the, the whole point, the theme, the main idea, the most important point of all of an ancient cultures mythology all right well probably all of these answers are possible the history of their political system you might find that in, in mythology kindness and generosity certainly could be a theme of a given myth but what if they have a thousand different myths will they all be about kindness and generosity I'm not so sure will they include things about the earth and human beings and their origins hmm well the keys to a happy and successful life. Certainly all of those could be possible, but which really is going to be a major theme that you're likely to encounter when you read the myth? Probably you'll have information about the origin of the earth and human beings and how we got here and why we happen to behave in a particular way uh, according to some myths from one culture which would vary from culture to culture but really creation mythologies are going to be the most uh, prevalent and that's why C is correct in this case even though all of the options look good C is the most correct of all and then we move on to uh, questions 21 and 22 and in this case once again, try that trick that I've been promoting. It may work. I hope it does. Read the questions first before you read the passage, because otherwise you don't know what you're reading for. So it says, this passage is typical of many traditional folk tales in, well, here are the characteristics they offer. Subtle characterization, in other words, not overtly absurd characters. Well, if I think of a folktale, I'm thinking of uh, maybe something like Br'er Rabbit. If you haven't read that, you may wish to uh, to do so. And Br'er Rabbit certainly is an outrageous trickster character. He's, or she, I'm not sure which it is, it's been a while since I read it, um, is uh, certainly outrageous in, in many ways. Satire of inept government officials and political factions, that's a little bit above a folktale. Now, maybe that type of thing certainly could exist, but... Um, I don't think I'm going after that one. Intricate plot, I would say a folktale is probably just a straightforward, entertaining story that has some kind of a point to it in the end. That's why D is correct. I mean, just the typical feature of many folktales is the inclusion of a character who's a trickster. And what you do then is apply these options to the passage, which I'm not going to read to you. When you do so, you will see clearly that D is the correct answer, that the plot is not intricate, that it's not really satirizing uh, government officials or, 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 or factions to a real high degree, I guess. And the characterization is certainly not subtle. Um, so D is the correct uh, response in, in, that, uh, in that case. Okay, so moving along to 22, the style of the passage uh, most likely reflects the style of many traditional folk tales in that, well, the answer is A, use of simple narrative structures with repeated words and phrases. So if you just look, look at the stylistic structure of that passage, you will see that. Um, because when you go to the go to be reliance on dialogue rather than expo exposition to advance a plot, mm, you know, it's not as correct as the uh, structure of its repeated words and simple phrases and simple narrative form. Uh, personification used to develop psychological psychological complexity. Well, there is personification in here. That's true because you have animals who are maybe behaving in ways that, that human beings would. But it is not really just that element that makes it correct. It's just the form, the form of the simple narrative structure with repeated words. Uh, reliance on extended metaphor to develop the primary theme. Well, it's not really an extended metaphor. If you want to know what an extended metaphor looks like, I'll show it to you right now. Extended metaphors are far more complicated. You have to remember the old man in the sea. And that is by Hemingway, and it includes a character who is the old man, for example. Since it's called the old man in the sea, obviously there ought to be an old man in it, and there is. And the old man is going on his last uh, fishing uh, journey, for example. And what is he fishing for? He's fishing for a fish, his last great fish that he wants to, to catch. So we have the old man, we have the fish. He does catch the fish. He's very happy that he does so. But then some sharks come along. 
and attack his wonderful fish. After they attack his fish, or a one shark in particular destroys his fish, uh, all that's left are bones. And those bones then float away to the other side of the island on which he lives. Some tourists see them. That says tourists. The tourists see the bones and comment that a storm must have killed the fish. Well, what is this extended metaphor really about? Well, here's one interpretation. The old man is really Hemingway, the author. He's old when he writes this particular tale. What is he after? His last great novel, or his last great story, however you want to look at it. And the sharks then, the sharks symbolize uh, critics. The bones symbolize reviews. And the tourists represent the public. And so one interpretation could be this, that the tourists, meaning we the public, only see the reviews. We, don't, we see none of the struggle that precedes it. And so all we see is really what's left after the critics destroy something. That's an extended metaphor. Uh, it's relying upon a lot of symbols to convey a message that's not overtly stated. And metaphors are implied comparisons. And this is certainly a very big implied comparison, therefore an extended metaphor. I don't see that in here. When you read this, I don't think you're going to see it either. And so the most correct answer then is a in this, uh, this particular case. Okay, well let's move on to the next uh, two questions. And here we have a poem. And I wouldn't start reading the poem until we read the question. In this poem, the repetition of words and rhythms reinforces the poem's metrical regularity. In other words, are the meters, the lines, do they scan with some regularity? Does it offer a mood of anxiety? Does it just do rhetorical emphasis, meaning that they repeat words that you should focus on, or is it hostile in tone? Well, when you read this, and let me just read maybe the opening uh, portion. Along in silent street, I walk in blackness, and I stumble and fall, and rise, I walk blind, my feet stepping on silent stones and dry leaves. Someone behind me also stepping on stones, leaves. If I slow down, he slows. If I run, he runs. I turn, nobody. Well, that is not really metrically regular. I sense a, suit of a, a mood of anxiety in there. I don't see C and D at all. Therefore, B would be the correct option uh, in, that, in that case because those type of repetitions that you see with nobody occurring a few times and the repetition of some words is conveying a mood of anxiety. This says the last two lines of the poem must uh, most clearly support which of the following themes. Well, we know it's a theme of maybe anxiety, and when we read the last two uh, sentence, uh, lines, where I pursue a man who stumbles and rises and says he sees me nobody, well, I mean, that's really conveying a sense of isolation. I think when you read that, that's what you're going to, uh, to get out of, out of that, because I don't see triumph over courage. I don't see cowardice of someone denying their true feelings because it is a very emotional poem. And also the importance of perseverance. I don't get that. That sense conveyed at all when I read this. It really does seem to be isolation and alienation. That is option D. So I'll circle that for you, and hopefully that made sense. Um, if not, uh, find a better way. Send it to me, and then I will re-record it. Cool, let's go on so that we're done almost. Here we have a very long poem, as you can see on uh, this page, and I would not start reading it until I read for the question to see what I am reading for. That, that didn't sound very grammatically correct, but I think you understand what I mean. In this poem, the image of the creature most, likely, most clearly symbolizes, in other words, represents what? And the answer is unavoidable, unavoidable persistent anguish or personal loss. So that's the correct answer. You would need to look at each one of the options and just shorten them. For example, is this about psychological disorientation and loss of religious faith? Is it about self-destructive behaviors? Is, about, is it about fooling oneself, fragmenting conscious, and then self-deception? In other words, fooling oneself? Or is it about unavoidable persistent anguish of personal loss? Well, when you shorten them like this and go back to the poem, I'm not going to read it to you, and you read all the way down through the creature, I think it's clear, it's clear to me when I read it, that it is about uh, personal loss of some kind and some kind of anguish. And um, turning back to the question now, 
it doesn't seem to be about losing religious faith or just self-destructive behaviors or deceiving oneself. It seems to be more ab about anguish over personal loss. And then when we read the um, narrator, how, well, how is the narrator's mood in this poem? And you look through it and you see that seeking to evade emotional pain through restless activity is what's going on in there. Um, it is not, I don't think when you read it, the narrator being so angry at himself or being so desperate for human companionship or being unwilling to acknowledge the fact of his uh, wife's death. It seems to be more about uh, keeping busy um, because of the unavoidable emotional anguish. And I think when you read that, that'll be uh, clear to you. It was to me. That's all I can tell you. Okay, well, thanks so much for listening. I hope you found this uh, helpful. The next thing that I'm going to do is the next half of this uh, subtest, which is social studies, and I will get to that just as soon as I, as I can. Thank you again. Goodbye.